And welcome back to This Week. Time now to get the views of our media and political experts, Nashville Democratic State Representative Brenda Gilmore, longtime Nashville political reporter Clint Brewer, and syndicated conservative talk show host Steve Gill. Guys, we were talking a little bit as we were watching the interview with Rich Rota about how difficult this is going to be to overhaul higher education in Tennessee, a huge system, three big boards, a lot of independence right now, and I guess we're just going to watch it kind of sausage be made as, as, it, as the process starts. Well, part of it is you've got the border regent system, you've got the UT system, and then because there's no great love loss between those systems, you've got to have the Tennessee higher education system that's kind of uh, kind of like mom, you know, whacking the kids in the back seat <laughs> to making them behave. That is a lot of bureaucracy, and we ought to be able to figure a way to do it better. And I think one of the things that I think we need to look at is what, what we're doing with the junior college system. And you look in Virginia and some other states, they really have a good, strong junior college system that flows into their four-year colleges. And I think Tennessee could probably do some good there. Maybe that's that fourth board we need. <laughs> well, and the idea here, and I think what the legislature is trying to do, is find some economy of scale. We have a big, unwieldy system mm -hmm. on the left. We have another big, unwieldy system on the right over here. Let's see if we can bring them together find some savings, and actually put that into the quality of education we're offering in higher ed in the state. The problem is just what Steve said. There are a lot of fiefdoms. And there are a lot of people that want to you know, protect their turf. And then there's the big 800-pound gorilla of the University of Tennessee itself. So getting this done is not a one, two, maybe even a three- or four-year process. I think it's just a great time, and because the economy is in such uh, dire states, it's screaming almost for us to to find the most efficient way to do things. We have these huge systems. It would be a great way for us to save money, to offer it in the way of scholarships, maybe even reduce the times that we have to continue to increase tuition. We've just raised the roof on these young people in Tennessee and almost priced them out of a, a good education. So I really would like to see it done. It's so political, though. <laughs> I have my money on the other side that that we're going to see major change. And that's the big goal, too, is we can eliminate costs to some degree, keep tuition in line, and eliminate repetition. Do we need, really need three of the same program at three universities? I guess it's just going to take a while. They want this done by January. That's going to be tough. Well, and part of it, I mean, it's not the first time that we've seen politics get embroiled in our higher education system. The whole reason they put a medical college up in Upper East Tennessee when you had one in Memphis was, well, we want one in our territory, right. too. So do you, do you put engineering schools in every section and in every sub-region? Do you put medical schools all over the place? All this has come up over time in a patchwork quilt that, again, was part of politics, not a part of policy. Well, and every member of the General Assembly who has an institution of higher learning, a public one, in their district is going to be trying to protect sure. that school. And that's another part of the politics, is all politics are local. Well, that's the case here, even though you're talking about two statewide uh, higher ed systems. I do like the fact, though, that it's forcing all three of those big, huge entities to talk to each other. Because even if we don't end up consolidating, I think that there, we're going to find some that there are some things that we can do better and more efficiently. This week in the Senate Judiciary Committee, with Republicans now in control of both the House and Senate, restrictive abortion language that could change the state constitution got out of that committee for the first time, will be voted on in the Senate maybe next week. And I guess the real question is, does this really do anything? It's a symbolic victory for the pro-life movement to get this this far, but does it really change anything? Certainly not immediately. I mean, this will not even have an impact unless Roe versus Wade gets overturned at the U.S. Supreme Court level. And then when, when that issue, if it happened, were to be turned over the states, the issue is do the courts in the states decide a new abortion, mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade rule, or would state legislators or would voters have the opportunity to decide? What this does is putting a vote a few years out, give the voters, give the legislature a say in that issue if Roe versus Wade gets overturned. From a legislative and a policy standpoint, it's exactly what Steve said. There's no, there's no difference right now unless Roe versus Wade goes away. What it does do is it puts a big deliverable on the table that the Republicans had to hand over to their core constituency and say, we got this done. And, you know, heading into another election year, that's something they're going to be able to walk out into the street and say, and carry with them and say, we did this. As a legislator, I will say I'm not pro-choice and I'm not pro-life. As a female, and what I hear from my <coughs> constituents was a very sad day to me because I think it's limiting the confidentiality as well as the rights of women to make their own decision. And most importantly, it's distracting time that we need to be spending as a legislature trying to figure out how we're going to get more people to work. Some of our counties in Tennessee, the unemployment is as much as 27 percent. 
and we're spending our time fussing about guns and abortions. So it was a very sad day for me. GOP lawmakers will say, though, that they were elected in office because the people of Tennessee approve of the, of the agenda that they have. And yet, if you look at the MTSU poll, it came out saying 52% of Tennesseans support abortion in some form. So there seems to be some kind of disconnect. Well, there does, and, and, you know, some of that might be what do people say when they get polled versus what they say, you know, when in, you're private, talking to in private. I mean, no, you know, I, I think there are very few people out there who are, in, you know, truly, like the representative said, in favor of abortion. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think what people worry about, though, are the social ramifications of telling a woman or a doctor what she can or can't do with their bodies. But uh, I think the Republicans did get elected somewhat on these social issues, and guns are right there with it. And I think when you see these issues come up before the full legislature, later, you're going to see Democrats uh, siding with the Republicans and voting for these things. I, these are so-called wedge issues, but I think you're going to see a lot of Democrats voting with the Republicans on the gun issues, on the abortion issue, on some of these other issues. And it's not even going to be a close call, I think, when it gets to the legislature. Well, there are certainly important issues and issues that need to be debated. I just don't think they need to be debated now. When we look at that same poll that you were referring to, the overall legislature got about 34%. Mm -hmm. And I think the sole reason because of that is because of the economy. They just want us to focus our attention on creating more jobs and getting more people back to work. Another issue before the state law legislature this week that got acted on, discussed, was banning text messaging while driving. It seems like a no-brainer, mm -hmm. and some, you know, kind of laugh at the idea, but it really is a danger out there, and it's going to actually be a little tougher than people think to get this passed. Yes, and that bill I agree with. I certainly think, I, although I do think that probably some of the prior bills that we've already passed covers the text message, but I certainly think that not only you're risking your own life, you're risking all those other people's lives that you come in contact with Texas. And it so, affects a lot of people who do it. So if it comes to the House, I will vote for that bill. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, State uh, Senator May Beavers made an interesting <clears throat> point. She was the lone dissenting vote on her own committee that she chairs that passed it, and she said, we can't really legislate against stupidity. Are we going to pass a law next that says that ladies can't put their makeup on while driving down the road? Or people can't read the newspaper or even make a phone call when going down the road? So I think it's going to pass, but I, I think it opens a, a kettle of uh, fish here, a can of worms. Pandora's so to speak. Boxes. Yeah, I mean, where, what, where do we stop with this kind of legislation? Yeah, not surprising. I agree with Senator Beavers. I mean, let's also add no writing of term papers, no reading of novels. I mean, go through the long, exhaustive list of don't do stupid stuff that distracts <laughs> you while you're driving. Let's just ban stupid stuff while you're driving and catch it all. That sounds like a good idea for a bill, then. No more stupid stuff. In D.C. this week, the criticism of President Obama is that he's trying to do too much too quickly needs to maybe focus his attention on the economy right now and as opposed to education and other issues responses I think that he's going just at the right pace that the citizens are requiring at this time that he, it's a balancing act and uh, getting education getting our students educating getting our level of knowledge up so we can compete with the whole world is so tied in with the economy that health care those three things are are, are three things that he's going to have to get his arms around almost 20 seconds. Well, I just say that, you know, he's done amazing things in his first 50 days. He's wiped $3 trillion in wealth off the map, and he's taken uh, 2 million people out of their jobs in just his first 50 days. I hope this is just the start uh, of, of, of maybe a turnaround rather than continuing to do 10 it. 10 seconds. I think what you're seeing is the American people's expectations meeting the level of the rhetoric and the inspirational speeches in the campaign, so they expect delivery on what he promised. Clint Brewer, Brenda Gilmore, Steve Gill, appreciate your insight. Stay with us as we continue in a moment. <laughs>